Doublespeak is language designed to evade responsibility, make the unpleasant appear pleasant, the uh, unattractive appear attractive. Basically, it's language that pretends to communicate, but really doesn't. It is language designed to mislead while pretending not to. Doublespeak is not a slip of the tongue or a mistaken use of language. It's exactly the opposite. It is language used by people who are very intelligent and very sophisticated in the use of language and know that you can do an awful lot with language. We should be aware of it so that we can at least be defensive and, and defend ourselves so that we're not misled through it. But secondly, there are times when we simply cannot tolerate this language. When we talk about important public issues of national policy, we should not use doublespeak as a nation. We should not use it ourselves. We should not allow the politicians who are speaking to us to use it. Language that way can be terribly corrupting in a society and can mislead all of us. And in a democracy that depends upon the active participation of its citizens, it can lead to cynicism and resentment and a withdrawal from the political process. Is that, does that have anything to do with the reason why the only 50% of the American people voted in 1988? I have a, a hypothesis that I would love to test, and, and I hope sometime to be able to do that. I would love to, to be able to track the pervasiveness of doublespeak as it grew, along with the decline in voting. Because the reaction I get to doublespeak from a lot of, uh, of readers of the Quarterly Review as they write to me is, well, of course I know this language. I see it all over the place. I see it all the time. But, you know, what, what else can you expect from politicians? They all lie. They all use doublespeak. It is that cynicism which leads to there's nothing I can do about it, so people withdraw. Is it true that, that you can put sugar free on a product and still have sugar in it? is probably the one question I've been asked most often because people simply can't believe that that, that happens. How can it happen? Because sugar-free simply means they haven't added table sugar or cane sugar to it. They can add manos, fructose, any of the uh, syrup sweeteners and still call it sugar-free. So, you know, when you eat something that's sugar-free, there's sugar in it. Oh, yes. And by the way, I found out in a radio uh, interview when they had uh, people in the audience calling in, a man called in and said, do you mean that there's sugar in there? I said, well, yes, there's sugars in that food. He said, well, I'm a diabetic, and my wife makes sure she buys only the sugar-free. I said, you can't eat those. You have to use only the dietetic, because that's governed by law. Sugar-free isn't. Here's a man who was threatening his health through this, this kind of false labeling. It was absolutely amazing. But the, the food, his novel, 1984, addressed the importance of language in society and the control and manipulation of language to control and direct uh, society. I think the most important point in 1984 is that power grows not out of the barrel of a gun. Power grows not out of the uh, thought police and rule by terror. It grows out of the power of language in that novel. What is reality? Reality is not external. Reality exists not in the mind of the individual, which soon perishes, but in the mind of the party, which is collective and immortal. What the party says is reality is real. And how else can the party do that? Except by language. The party has taken control of language and has taken it away from the individual. And that's the power, because those in power who control language control the way we see the world. See, any, any politician in power starts using doublespeak. The Democrats did. I, I love Jimmy Carter's uh, comment on the failed raid to free the hostages in Iran. He called it an incomplete success. He did that without even thinking about it. He, it, he was just automatically using that kind of language. But we had double speak. So there's, there's always a mixture of language because anyone who reaches any position of power must either instinctively or knowingly know how to use double speak and know how to use it at a certain time and when to turn it on and off, and to what degree. You, you can simply track that in anyone um, in the rise to power. Uh, I'm trying to think of the great Spencer Tracy movie. Um, it's a classic film where he's running for president. He's the ordinary man who gets caught up in the presidential race, and he becomes a national hero. And one of the things they do in the movie is show that as he moves closer to getting the nomination, he starts using more and more of what we would call doublespeak until finally there comes a scene at the end of the movie when he gets so disgusted with what he has become that he quits the race 
and will not, even though he has by this point become a shoe in for the nomination, if not the election, he just quits it. But the movie has traced the compromises that he makes through language in order to achieve it. And I think that uh, the, the American public believes that, that in order to get that far, you have to sell off so much that there's not much left at the other end and that it's reflected in the language that you use. Done when on purpose and with calculation and you said yes. Yes. In fact, I, the, 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 I cite a couple incidents, incidents in the book where I can document it was done. One is revenue enhancement. They had a meeting in the Office of Management and Budget. They said, we need a phrase to replace tax increase. They came up with revenue enhancement. When uh, Lawrence Kudlow, the economist, uh, was asked why they did that, he said, because there's no better way to sell economic policy than the euphemistic route. He was quite proud of the fact that they came up with that phrase. And Peacekeeper, as the name for the MX missile, again, Robert McFarlane chaired the committee meeting in which he facetiously suggested that they couldn't name it uh, Widowmaker, could they? So instead, they came up with Peacemaker. But later, President Reagan misread his, his cue cards and said, uh, uh, Peacekeeper. And since it was a televised speech, it became the Peacekeeper. And it was a name that was deliberately designed to make a nuclear missile sound nice. Does it work? Yes. Oh, of course it works. I mean, most people don't hear it. Um, they will hear some of it, but not all of it. One of my favorite examples from this past year is the resource development park that they were going to establish in Kansas City until the good folks uh, in the neighborhood where they were going to put the park asked, what is a resource development park? Do you know what a resource development park is? In Kansas City, it's a dump. They were going to put a dump in their neighborhood until somebody asked what it meant. They deliberately invented that phrase to try and slip a dump into the neighborhood without anyone noticing it until it was too late. We 